All right. I love this visual representation of uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And that's the page that we're on. It's page 676 in the Red Bibles in your pew. Uh, and it's Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And again, if you don't have a Bible, that Red Bible in front of you in the chair or beside you is uh, the Catalyst's gift to you. Uh, Catalyst is passionate about seeing God's Word go out into the community. And this is just one of the ways that they are able to see that happen. And so uh, please take that. That's Catalyst's gift to you. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to this Christmas Unplugged series that Dave's been going on through for the past few weeks. I, I've been uh, working through that as well. And, uh, you know, as he, he moves through some of the key players uh, in the, 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 the nativity scene, the, the Christmas story, uh, we've seen some neat videos about that. I've been excited to see what Catalyst has got. Dave's out. You know, you got Caleb just got back from New York. You got people uh, getting ready for this Fort Wayne trip. If, am I right? Coming up before too long. You'll hear more about that. Big things are happening. Uh, you know, this, this food drive. I'm excited about that. You know, bringing in 30 cans. I have three little boys and a beautiful wife, and they're not here with me this morning because uh, they are sick. They played out in the snow too much. We got fevers, and my wife woke up with no voice this morning, which uh, has its benefits. You know, it's, it's, it, it could be whatever. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I adore my beautiful wife. She's fantastic. Uh, but it, it probably doesn't matter that they're not here anyways this morning because if they would have watched that video and saw that all they had to do was bring in some cans to be registered to win an Xbox, they would have been out the door running to buy low anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered. So they've got some uh, exciting things. Christmas has been going on. I know that you guys have been in the series. And uh, last week, if you'll remember, we looked at the birth of Jesus. And this week, I want to just keep right on rolling with this theme of, of Christmas Unplugged. And I want to look at the, th- the three wise men, or as our video showed, it could have been a numerous amounts of wise men. We don't know for sure. That's not necessarily important. The fact that these men came is what is important. And we'll talk about what the significance of that and what that matters. And so uh, wise men worship Jesus, not themselves. That's kind of what we're going to be looking at this morning. Wise men worship Jesus, not themselves. Kings fear Jesus, not themselves. And so when we talk about this, uh, Jesus being lifted high, Jesus being giving all authority in scripture, if I had to say this sermon, what this would look like in one sentence, it would be this. Only one is meant to be the center of the universe and only one is worthy of our worship. And so only one is worthy of our worship. That's what we're going to be fleshing out this morning as we work through this. Uh, so again, chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, uh, we're going to be looking at this. And on the screen, you'll see four points that we're going to be hitting on this morning. One, we're going to be looking at the wise men's question. We're going to be looking at Herod's question for number two. Number three, we'll look at Herod's response to the question. And then at number four, we'll look at the wise men's response. So I want to be able to t- uh, walk you through this scripture. We're just going to exegetically just pick this apart, just walk through it. And uh, I'm excited about what it's got. I- I've been convicted, uh, super encouraged the whole nine yards this week just from my personal study in this section. And so uh, Matthew, if you're aware, if you've been uh, keeping up with where we're at here, Matthew has set out to prove that Jesus is the Christ. And in chapter one, we see this genealogy. We see the virgin birth. Uh, which has told us about Isaiah chapter 7. And this morning, we aren't just going to look at uh, the virgin birth, but also about the location of this virgin birth and how this is evidence of Christ, the Messiah, coming. And so that's the context of where we're at. Now, Matthew opens this up in, in, in verse 1 by talking about the days of Herod. If you got your scripture, you see that uh, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, and then it talks, continues on about the wise men. But I want to stop right there. Uh, you know, when we're talking about the gospel, and that's really where we've been in this Christmas Unplugged series, is we've just been picking apart the, the, the key players of Jesus' birth that will lead to the gospel, of course, as our Savior who dies on the cross. And, and so whenever we're talking about the gospel, when we're talking about the, the birth of Jesus, I think it's important that we understand that everything that we're working through in Scripture, everything that Dave's up here preaching about, everything that small groups are teaching, everything that the the kids are learning right now, these out of the Scripture aren't just things that some men got together and said, look, life stinks. Life's hard. Let's put some of this stuff together. Let's put some moralistic teachings in one place, and let's just see how they roll out. This is history, what we read when we pick this book up, when we pick the Holy Scriptures up. We're reading God's inerrant word. And so I think it's very important that we just stop. And and these are real events and that we understand that this isn't just a group of guys who got together. Uh, We see also the location of these events. Uh, If you continue on in verse one, these wise men, where do they come from? The east, west, south, or north? East. 
They come from the east. Now, we don't know where they came from in the east. You know, I've heard different speculations, Persia or different areas, because if it took them two years to get here, they would have traveled from all these different, the bottom line is we don't know. And that's okay that we don't know that. The bottom line is that we know that they traveled from the east and the significance of where they came from doesn't necessarily matter, but what we do know is that they came from the east. Now, there's something really cool about that, and we're going to hit on that in just a little while, because the east is, uh, you, you have these men coming into Jerusalem, and we're going to kind of hone down on this. Uh, you know, I think this is, there's a huge theological point uh, here, because Scripture, again, doesn't specify where they came from, but what we see is that God has appointed Christ, the one true Savior of Jerusalem or of the world? Of a world. But if it was just for Jerusalem, some Jerusalem people would have gotten together and went to worship him, right? But these men come from where? The east? These are Gentiles. These aren't Jewish guys. These are guys who are like me. I mean, there's stand, normal guys like you, just normal folks. And they're traveling from the east to see this Christ, th this baby. And so this is a huge theological point that we need to just grab onto for a second. This isn't even one of my main points, but I just am so passionate about this. I think it's important that we recognize that Christ came into the world as this little baby, as the king, which would be our savior, as our savior. But he didn't just come for this, this, the Israelites, the Jewish people, did he? You see all these other people, however many kings there were, we'll say three just for the sake. You have these kings coming in and they're worshiping. That's what they're there to do. And I want to hone down on that a little bit more. But I, that, that theological point of that, that Christ didn't just come for the Jewish people is phenomenal to me. Uh, and so uh, Jew and Greek, slave free, male, female, we see that in Galatians. In every tribe and tongue and people and every nation, he's a savior of the world. And these wise men that we have coming in are a testimony to the reality that he is a savior to the world. And so here, they're traveling to Jerusalem, which for a Bible scholar at this time would be kind of the hub of religious activity, right? Like uh, the capital of the U.S. is, you know, Washington, and you got all this political uh, stuff happening there, right? I mean, it's, that's the place to go. If you want to see a bill made or a law made or you want to lobby somebody, that's the place to go, right? In this time, if you want to go to the religious hub of that time, it would have been Jerusalem. And so you have these wise men they're coming to Jerusalem, so it makes sense that that's where they would be going. And when they hear word of a king, where do they go? They go to the king, don't they? Kind of makes sense. We can kind of see the, the train of thought there. And they, they go to the king, <clears throat> and that's our first point this morning. You see that up on the screen. Where, uh, the wise men's question is, where is the king who has been born king of the Jews? Where is the king who has been born king of the Jews? And to me, this is a really interesting question because these three wise men, again, they're not Jewish. So why would they be looking for a king who is born king of the Jews if they're coming from the east? What's their plan? What's their, their motive behind this? You know, look at verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose. And here's why we've come. We have come, why? To worship him. We have come to worship him. These wise men from the east, these Gentiles, are coming in to worship him. They've been reading the stars. They're looking for the king of the Jews. And, and it makes sense that they would go to the ki current king. And so whenever they do that, they're coming uh, to the Jewish people, the people of God who have been following God. And uh, these men have been following not just scripture, but evidence, the star in the sky. And so these men are traveling along by star, which, again, we don't know if this star was a comet. We don't know if this was just some supernatural divine star put there specifically to lead these men. Doesn't say, and it doesn't matter, right? Because all we know is that these men came to worship the one and true king. And so let's pause right here, and let me ask you, just in regards to these wise men, they're following this star in order to what? Worship this baby king. How do we compare to these wise men? Are you led to worship yourself as the center of the world? Do you put yourself at the foundation of your existence, of your being, of your life? Or are you compelled by looking at life to conclude that there is something, someone bigger than me, bigger than you, in charge of this thing? When was the last time that you, like these wise men, looked up at the stars or, or looked at the moon, or maybe it was the Grand Canyon, or maybe it was Niagara Falls, or, you know, or a rainbow, 
and looked at nature and said, you know what? There is something bigger than this. There's something bigger than this going on out there. There is a creator that created this. And you just, it's, it's imprinted on your heart. We, we are inherently know there is a creator. And that's why, it, you know, there's so many different belief systems. Now we're, we're searching for a creator. We're looking for something that makes sense. And so you are born inherently with a, a desire, a, 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 a know that there is a creator that created these things. Uh, you know, when we look at these wise men, they looked on the star. They traveled by star. This is not an application point that uh, Herod necessarily focused on. He wasn't really pumped about this opportunity that these three Eastern Gentiles, wise men, had in coming to worship the king. You think they were excited about it? He was excited about it? The king, Herod? Now, King Herod was a bad dude. Herod was not happy with these three wise men and, again, felt that there was somebody coming to challenge his authority. I mean, they're, they're coming to him, current king, and saying, hey, got a great question for you. Where's this new king of all kings at? You think he's happy about that? Oh, my goodness, no. But he plays it cool, doesn't he? Herod's a smart cookie, man. He plays it cool. And so I like kind of watching how he interacts with this situation. Uh, you know, he's mad. Why? Because he's renting the throne. He doesn't own the throne. And he's upset about that. He's upset about that. You know, this is not just any king they're looking for, but who? The king. And it rubs him the wrong way. He's in charge. He's in power. He doesn't want anybody moving in on what he's got, on his control. Herod has been appointed king by Roman authority. But this king that they're searching for is birth king. He is king uh, at birth. The second he comes into this world, he is the king of kings. Herod may not see it that way. Sorry, though, Herod. It, it stinks to be you, bud. But that's the truth. This is the king of kings. And so there is a troubled reality for King Herod at this point. So not only is Herod troubled, but look at verse 3. And I find this just a, a bummer, really. It's, it's horrible. Verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, which we expect. He was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Now this troubles me. I, I'm really, I'm, this tugs at my heartstrings because when we look at Herod, I expect for this uh, this dude to be a little upset about this, right? I mean, the guy's a tool, if we're just being honest with it. He's, he's, he's tripped out. I mean, the guy has killed a lot of people, and we'll get into some of that historical stuff here in a second, but uh, to, wh the Jewish people, why are they upset? Why are they upset? Shouldn't they, as people who have set under Scripture, every Saturday, they, were ha they had the rabbis teaching them, shouldn't they be excited about this opportunity? especially if they know Herod. And the Bible doesn't tell us why, they, why they're upset and, and why they're troubled with Herod. You know, one reason it could be because they know who Herod is and they know how this guy is going to react. Herod was a bad, bad man. Herod was a tyrant. Just so you have a little bit of historical context of who this Herod was, he killed two of his own sons so that no one else would be in line of power before, after he was gone. I mean, the dude murdered his two sons, uh, murdered one of his wives. Uh, at, at the time of his death, he killed over 100 cabinet members because he didn't want anybody stepping up into power after he was gone. This, this guy's crazy. And so as a, as, a, as a Jewish person living in this time, you know this guy's off his rocker with power. I, you know, the guy's nuts. And you got three guys coming up saying, hey, it's good to see you, King Herod. Where's the king of kings? Oh, Herod's like fuming at this point, right? And the people have to be looking at this going, oh, that's awesome. No, don't say it, you know. They've got to be stressed out over this. And with good reason, because before long, Herod's ch killing babies. And we're not talking about some kind of uh, uh, civilized death. We're talking clubs. Spears and knives. I mean, bad stuff. So this Herod guy is bad news. And the fact that these, these three wise men are searching for the king of kings is not fair well for them as well. Uh, so, you know, whenever we're looking at this, this uh, wise men's question leads us to point number two. And you'll see that up on the screen. The wise men, or Herod's question, I'm sorry, where is the king to be born? The wise men's question leads us to Herod's question, 
which is, where is the king to be born? All right, it's a fair question for the guy, right? I mean, you don't know his motives, maybe yet. We do, we've read the story, we know this account. But if you weren't, this would be very interesting. You'd be thinking, ah, oh, he's wanting to go worship. He wants to go worship this king. What a great guy. But we know that's not the case. Here it plays it cool. Knowing what a scoundrel that this guy is, we might think, again, that he should immediately bow down and be excited for the king of Jews to come, the king, the prophesied king. Now, this is very interesting because Herod's no idiot. Herod's not a dummy. If you look at verse 4, look at the way that Herod even asks the question. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the who? The Messiah, the Christ, is to be born. Now, if he was ignorant of Scripture, he might just say, all right, so where is this baby that's going to be the king of the Jews going to be born at? Where is he at? But he doesn't say that, does he? We know that Herod understands and has looked at Scripture because even the way that he asks that question, you know, you may have a different version. Mine says Christ, but maybe, uh, you know, yours says Messiah. Maybe it says king. So whenever you're looking at this, he's using language that says he knows who these men are looking for, right? He's aware of it. And so whenever we're looking at this, even the way that he asks that question shows that he's one, not ignorant. He's very well studied. He understands. He knows scriptures. Uh, and so this makes for a very unsettling reality for him when he starts using language like, so where is this Christ that's to be born? That's huge. That's huge. So out of his stress, we see that he's pulled out together these, these priests, these scribes, uh, in verse 4 to get their answer to this question. And I love their response. In verse 5, they say, well, that this child is to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now, why do these men, these men answer him in this way? Is it because they uh, took some chicken bones out of a bag, shook them up and threw them on the ground and tried to, like, uh, interpret them? Yeah. These are just intelligent men who have had the Scriptures, the Old Testament, same Old Testament we have. They had the Old Testament, and that Old Testament foretells of the Christ, the Messiah's coming, his birth. And so these men are just going, well, uh, you know, we're, we're not looking at a magic ball. We can tell you where he's going to be born because it says it in Scripture. And so they're telling King Herod this. And you've got to know that they're shaken. You know, this has got to be a nerve-wracking, unsettling moment for them to have to tell the King Herod this information. And so in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that's the backup to their claim. You don't have to flip there. But if you want to write that down, you can. That's the scripture. That's the prophecy that says uh, he'll be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And so it's backing up their claim. I love this. The reality of this is it, it's, it's true for us today. Uh, it was true that day. The Old Testament and the New Testament, Christ being born, it was all working together, wasn't it? It still is that way today, isn't it? This Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, does it flow together? Man, absolutely. It's so, I do a lot of college ministry, and sometimes it's hard for college students to just be hungry for the Old Testament because it may be difficult for them to read because there's a lot of historical context that you may need to be digging into and, and, and getting with before you can really maybe understand some of that stuff. Uh, and, uh, but the reality of it is the Old and the New Testament work beautifully together. And for us to not see that, for us to not see Jesus throughout the Old Testament, Jesus was born in the New Testament, but was Jesus in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Absolutely. You see that through prophecy. You see that from Genesis, that Jesus was there with God, the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is just now, we're interested because he's come to earth, right? We even have a self, uh, uh, an egocentric view of how we view this, don't we? We're excited because he's come to earth to where we are. Well, he's been there the whole time. It's just now in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 uh, through 12, we're seeing Jesus come to the flesh. And so that's exciting. That's, a neat, that's neat for us. And so that's where they're getting this answer from. The New and the Old Testament work together. Now, in verses 4 and 5, we see uh, some different Jewish demographics. And we just talked about the Jewish people and, and how they really, of all people, should be extremely excited about this news, right? This is the king of kings. This is 
the, the, the foretold, the, the prophesied king that's going to come and set things right. This is a good thing. But I'm not seeing a lot of in- excitement, a lot of interaction with him. Watch what it says here in verses 4 and 5. We see four different Jewish demographics. And I'm going to say that one is Herod the king. We see the people of Jerusalem. We see the priest and the scribes and uh, just these Jewish folks. So here's what I find interesting about that. Herod, again, knows enough about Scripture to call this baby the Messiah or the Christ. He knows who the baby that these wise men refer to really is, doesn't he? He knows. And does he start packing up a bag so he can go worship this child? No. No. What about the... uh, Verse 4, again, we hit on this. The, the people of Jerusalem, they were troubled with Herod. They've had scriptures. They've had the rabbis teaching them every Saturday night from the Old Testament. They know the prophecy. They know who this is. Do you see them packing up to go worship this king? No. No. What about the Jewish priests and the scribes in verse 4? They know scripture even enough to quote it from Micah chapter 5, don't they? These guys aren't dummies. These aren't people who are unschooled or uneducated. They're smart. They're intelligent. But do you see them packing up and making preparations to go worship this new king of the Jews? No. No, you don't see that, do you? You know, if, I'm, I, 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 if I hadn't already read this biblical account, again, we may look at this and be like, oh, look at this. All these Jewish people, they're saddling up. You know, they're getting ready because they're going to go out uh, and, and see where this baby is. They even know where the baby's at because the prophecy foretells in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, where the baby's going to be. They know right where they're going, but nobody saddles up. Nobody cowboys up, do they? They all just stay put. Some of them really don't like it. So you have these scribes and these priests And from this point, they just kind of fade off the story. They just kind of go away. And so if I hadn't already heard this, again, I might think that these men should be making preparations. But instead of any of these Jewish people going, who's making the preparations? The wise men. From where? We're not even talking about wise men from Jerusalem. We're talking about wise men from the east. Isn't that insane? Isn't that crazy to think about that of all the people who would want to come and worship the new king of the Jews, it's these guys from the east, these Gentile believers. You know, here they are, they're coming that way. And I think that's amazing. The, 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 The wise men were different from the priests and the scribes. You know, the priests and the scribes were religious people, right? Not dummies. They were intelligent. They were religious people. You think they loved God? They probably loved the Lord. You think they love scripture? Yeah, I'd say they love scripture. They studied it. They were well versed on scripture. But they were different. It was hypocrisy at its best. These religious people who had scripture and tradition, but not the person of Jesus. The ones who should see it the most clearly are the most blinded. And those that are following, they're following a star. They see it so clearly, don't they? They're following a star. How much sense does that make? You know, wake up one night and just be like, we're following this star. I don't know. You know, the scripture, it's a star. That's it right there. Let's follow it, you know, for years. We're talking a couple years. This wasn't like a, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll just walk to Newburgh, you know, or we'll walk to Walmart and back. This was years of walking and traveling. And so, uh, you know, I've heard one pastor say this before. It was an illustration of a man who was sent to an airport. And this man was there to pick up another person he had never met. So he knew that this other man was getting off the airplane. He was supposed to pick him up. So how does he know? He's got the name and he's got this picture of this guy. And he's looking as people are stepping off the plane. And he's checking. No, no, no. You know, finally the guy steps off the plane and it matches the picture. And he looks and he goes, yep, that's him right there. And then instead of taking that man that got off the plane out for dinner and having good, sweet fellowship with that man, the guy has uh, grown so close to this, ph- this photo. He takes the Polaroid and he's like, I'm going to just take this. It's, it's what it's like with these, these scribes. They have this picture. They're, they know what they're looking for. But when it actually comes, they've grown so accustomed to the picture itself, they just would rather hold on to that and just ignore the actual coming of the guy off the airport or the coming of the king, which doesn't make sense, but it happens. He's decided to go uh, with these men. And so this is a good illustration of these priests and these scribes 
all throughout the gospel. If you're familiar with any of the gospel beyond chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, you see priests, you see these scribes, you see them in Paul's letters, and they're just, they're, they're drowning in religion. They're drowning in knowledge of the scripture, but not a, a face, not the person of Christ himself. Does that make sense? They love the knowledge and the fact that they have that hope, but when the hope becomes flesh, they don't realize it. They just move right on. They just move right on. And it's possible, and I, this is huge in our, in our culture. There's a, a point that we need to make here. It is possible to know great things about God, yet not know him at all. Isn't that true? It is possible for us to know great things about God, but not know him. It is possible to memorize the entire gospel, but have no relationship with Christ himself. And I would say that's an application for this point. We need to have a balance between Christian knowledge and Christian action. These men were all knowledge, but their action, their heart, it, 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 they didn't see Christ for who he was. They just held on to the knowledge that they had. <coughs> knowledge is necessary, but is knowledge sufficient for salvation? Absolutely not. I may know that Jesus is, is even the Savior, I may know that chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, speaks of a coming king that will one day die on the cross and three days later rise from that grave in order to save people from their sins. I may have that knowledge, but without the receiving of that knowledge, I'm just as lost as the next person. So knowledge is not sufficient for salvation. Scripture tells us to apply the Bible to our lives every single day, does it not? That, and this is huge. If, you, if you're a new believer, if you're a believer who's been there for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, great. This is true for all of us. We are to take what we read from this scripture and apply it. That's one of the things I'm super encouraged about when I look at the Catalyst Church. You got a pastor who's not sitting in his office every week waiting for Sunday to roll around so he can come up here and speak. Where is he at right now? Yeah, he's on a mission field, Right? He's out in a mission field. Caleb, the dude who leads your music, you know, he, he just got back from New York. Your, your church is preparing for an opportunity to go to Fort Wayne to serve refugees. That's awesome. That is taking the knowledge and doing something with it, right? That's taking the knowledge and living it out. That's being missional. That's being passionate for what God is passionate about. And so that's, there's a fine line in that knowledge and that action that we need to be aware of. And these men were just hypocrites. They had the knowledge, but no action, no heart, no vision for the person of Christ. They just want to hold on to the scripture, just to the knowledge of Christ. And so there has to be a good balance in that. Now, I also want to say this. Uh, we need to be aware that knowledge, I'm not dogging knowledge, because knowledge is most definitely important. Is it not? It is. We have to have knowledge. And there comes that fine balance, right? If all I do is study and sit inside of an office, if that's all your pastor did, if that's all that Dave did, he'd be very well versed in the scriptures and may even be a good preacher. But what about the application? What about living it out? Where's the lot? You know, I know that you all do every so often where a Sunday where you just go out and serve the community. You know, that, that's awesome. That's really cool. And uh, so knowledge is important. But if that's all that we're hanging on to, we're missing it. But we have to have knowledge, don't we? we? And here's what's cool about this. Understand this. People around us need to feel and understand that seeing and believing Jesus Christ is not the act of a weak person or a dumb person or a person looking for a crutch in life. Is that why we believe in Jesus? Absolutely not. Now, is there hope and joy and, and salvation? Absolutely. There's no question but we don't, we don't hold on to Jesus simply because, well, there's nothing else better going on in my life. I guess I'll try this out for a change. That's not what it's about. It's, he's not a crutch. And to have that knowledge, to have that understanding of who Christ is, what he came for, and now what my responsibility in Christ is, is huge. And so it does. There is a very, they hold hands, the knowledge, the action, and the heart. And so we also have to be aware that knowledge isn't all there is to it, but we also have to understand that knowledge is important. And so, looking at our points, we've seen what the wise men's question is. We've seen what Herod's question is. And now we look at Herod's response. 
You see that on the screen, and it is go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Now, we know from reading the rest of the story that Herod's just a liar, just a dirty, dirty liar, right? But he wants to trick these men into giving him information of where the king is so that he can worship, but so he can kill this, this baby king. So Herod appears to be humble. He appears to be eager to worship Jesus, but inside he just wants Jesus out of the way. Why? So that he can be worshipped. So that he can be the foundation of all the attention and the love and admiration of these people. He's a false worshiper. A false worshiper. And here we really have to, to look at our motives for worship and decide, well, what is our heart for worship? The false worshiper says, I love God, but actions show that I love my money more or that I love my job more or that I love my kids more or that I love relationships more. The false, false worshiper says, I'll make much of God as long as God makes much of me. Their happiness of a false worshiper is contingent on their circumstances. If I'm happy and God is for me, then who can be against me? But if my circumstances are less than desirable, maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you're not making the money that you want to be making right now. Maybe you've got some trials and temptations on the horizon that you know are coming up. Maybe you're in the midst of it. Maybe you've had a death in the family, and here it is Christmas. This is a hard time of the year for you. You're really feeling the impact and the weight of that sadness. You know, Christmas is a happy time, but it can also be a sad time. No matter what your circumstances are, we are to worship God even when things aren't going our way. It's easy to say that, isn't it? Yeah. We're to worship God even when things don't go our way. But how do we do that? What, how do we make that real? You know, uh, my grandma has this cool old lady. She's still kicking it, and she's just awesome. And she would travel and, and went to a lot of different trips. And one of her, her trips that she went on was to Russia. And this was back in the day when Russia was not a pleasant place to be. And uh, she had traveled, and, and she was able to take three Bibles with her. I think that, that was, for whatever reason, that was the limit that you could take. So she took these three Bibles with her, and uh, she had them in her purse. And everywhere she goes, she tries to bring back a knife for my grandpa. It's just like how she is. That's, that's his souvenir that she, he gets. And so she was traveling around. She's looking at all these shops, can't find a knife anywhere. And she's looking, and finally, she looks in the window of this watchmaker in, in this village that she goes to, and she walks in, and she sees this man, and he's got this knife. And he's... he's Got it opened up, and it isn't a very attractive knife. Not much to it, really. But he's using it as a screwdriver. He's using it to pry open his clocks, his watches, to fix things, right? This is his tool. And uh, she says, you know, in as much broken language as she can muster and as much broken English as this guy can muster, she wants to trade him. Uh, money. Here, take this money. I've got money. Would you please trade? And he's like, no, 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 no. I can't do that. You know, again, this is what this guy uses as a tool. And so she takes the money, she opens up her purse, and she sticks it back in there. But while her purse is open, what does this man see? He sees a Bible. And this guy starts flipping out. And my grandma thinks the guy's going to attack her or something, right? And, and she, he, he starts pointing to her purse. And he's saying, yeah, whatever it is he says in Russian, you know. And he's showing. And she pulls out a couple things. And finally, she pulls out the Bible. And he really gets excited. He's jumping up and down. He's jumping up and down. And he's, they, they negotiate a trade. God's word for the tool that supports his family and, and helps him create a, a life for income. And so he takes this thing back there and he shines it up for her. And uh, he gives this to her. And uh, she let me borrow this for this illustration. But the, the, the point that I want to make with this is that this man, uh, above all else, treasured what? God's word. God's holy scriptures, knowing that the power and the life that was in there, I don't know where this guy's at. I don't know if this guy's alive. I don't know if this guy became a pastor. I don't know if this guy led his family to Christ with God's word. I don't know. But God knows. And whenever I look at somebody like this, I'm so encouraged that this man is willing to put down anything else. His circumstances all of a sudden go away. Doesn't matter if that's his tool, he'll find something else. Even if he's got to grow his fingernails out longer and just start using those as a screwdriver, he's going to do it. Why? Because he wants God's word. He's thirsting for it. He's thirsting for it. He's looked around. He's seen that there is something bigger than him. And he knows that this right here has answers. 
And he's willing to give up anything and everything it takes in order to see what God's word says to him. That's a man willing to apply the knowledge that he gleans from God's word into the life of him and his family. So are we worshiping God because it's convenient for us? Or are we worshiping because he's worthy of our worship? And we'll look at what that looks like to be worthy of our worship. So that's the third point, Herod's response. The fourth point is, well, what's the wise man's response to this? You see on the screen uh, Herod's response, and the fourth point is the wise man's response. What did they do? They fell down and worshiped him. There's actually a lot more to this. This is pretty juicy stuff, but I just want to keep it simple. So if you look at, uh, at blah, 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 where's that? Eight, nine. Look at verse uh, 10. Look at verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary into the house. They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And then they opened up their gifts, their treasures. And so what is worship, first of all, before we even start getting into this whole concept of us worshiping, why should we worship? How do we worship? You know, what is worship? I've got it defined as this. Worship is honor and adoration directed toward God. Worship is honor and adoration directed toward God. So for these wise men, I would not say that it was convenient for them to worship this king, would you? These men traveled for years uh, on donkey, camels, whatever you want to say. It wasn't comfortable, though, I can tell you that. We're not in a Benz driving to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem to see this baby born. They're, uh, they face a tyrant. That's a pretty huge thing, right? How many of us want to go up against a, a mad tyrant and be like, hey, where's your predecessor? No, 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 not just the, the predecessor. The guy who's going to blow you out of the water. That's who we came to see. Good to see you, though. We're, hi, Herod. You know, these men have traveled. They've given up. And they have sacrificed. Their circumstances are less than beautiful. You know, I wouldn't want to do it, you know. Uh, it's not something I would desire to do. But these men know where they're going. They have it in view. And all else, nothing else matters. Nothing else mattered. God's word. These men, nothing else mattered. God's word. They followed and they uh, obeyed. And then they worshiped. And so when you see this, for these wise men, they travel. And in verse 10, they see a star and they're joyed. In verse 11, they see Mary and their hearts are tender. Then they see Jesus the king and they worship. And this moment they've been waiting for is a reality where their faith goes from just faith to actual sight. They're looking down on this king. They see this baby king. And now they're finally doing what they set out to do in verse 2 of chapter 2, which is what? To worship him. And why worship him? Why would they go all that way to worship him? I know the scriptures say, the king of the Jews, the king of kings, they go... But look at, it, look at me with chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name, what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Which means what? God. Which means God with us. This is why they worship, and this is why we worship. I've got this awesome video I want to show you real quick. It's from uh, Charles Spurgeon. It's a collection of one of his sermons, and I just want you guys to see this because it hits on this Emmanuel, God with us. So we'll cue the video.
with us. It is hell's terror. Satan trembles at the sound of it. His legions fly apace. The black-winged dragon of the pit quails before it. Let Satan come to you suddenly and do you but whisper the word, God with us, and back he falls, confounded and confused. Satan trembles when he hears that name. God with us. It is the laborer's strength. How could he preach the gospel? How could he bend his knees in prayer? How could the missionary go into foreign lands? How could the martyr stand at the stake? How could the confessor acknowledge his master? How could men labor if that one word were taken away? God with us is the sufferer's comfort is the balm of his woe, is the alleviation of his misery, is the sleep that God gives to his beloved, is the rest after exertion and toil. God with us is eternity's sonnet, is heaven's hallelujah, is the shout of the glorified, is the song of the redeemed, is the chorus of angels, and is the everlasting oratorio of the great orchestra of the sky. God with us. God that created every star, every grain of sand on every beach. This is the God that created every hair on your head. God, perfect in nature, perfect righteousness, holiness, sinless God came down in this earth in the form of Jesus. Came to an earth full of sin. Came to an earth where he cried, laughed, ate, slept, and was even tempted like we all are. And this all happened, and he still overcame sin. He still overcame and defeated death. The miracle of God with us is worthy of these wise men's worship, and it's worthy of our worship. When God with us, when God came down to take on flesh, I said earlier that, uh, you know, the kind of the, the sentence that I would give this is, only one is meant to be the center of the universe, and only one is worthy of our worship and our praise. And I have a challenge for the people in this room. I have a challenge for myself. And as the musicians come up, I just want to be able to interact with you on some of these points. You know, maybe you are a believer in this room. And right now, my question is, are you a casual worshiper that comes in on a Sunday You've, maybe you've lived your week and you've come in Sunday morning and you decide that God is going to get all your attention. It's Sunday morning. You've come to church. You woke up early. You've gotten here. You ate your donut. You ate your coffee. And you've come in here and you are prepared and ready for worship. And if so, praise God. But I challenge us not to be casual worshipers. Because whenever I look at a Sunday, are you here being edified? Are you here hearing the word, the preaching of God's word? Uh, maybe it's not this Sunday. Maybe it's last Sunday. Or it's going to be the next Sunday and David's back uh, and, and Caleb's playing music and you're, you're listening to the theology of the music, the theology of the songs, and you're just passionately taken back. Your heartstrings are being pulled. Maybe you're here and you're that kind of a person. And if so, I want to challenge you as we meet on a Sunday in this building 
Is this the, the beginning of your worship? And my challenge for you is, do you go throughout your entire week to show up on Sunday to begin worshiping or is Sunday morning the ending of your worship in a week? Do you begin, once you get here on Sunday, God, you get my best today. I'm going to worship you during this service and it's even going to last a little bit past lunch. Or is this just the ending of your week's worship? When you come to church on Sunday and you've had work, you've had school, you've had family, you've had home, and that's where you've been spending all week worshiping through your actions as a parent, through your actions as a spouse, through your actions as a coworker, as a neighbor, as a friend. Have you worshiped the king throughout your week? Or have you waited for Sunday morning to come so that you can set this two hours aside and really give God all? I hope you're giving God your all. This is, what we're doing is biblical. This is a biblical vision of what worship and fellowship comes to whenever believers come together in Jesus Christ and God's word is preached. God's, God's theology and his songs are sung. But there's so much more than just this hour and a half, this two hours that we're here. Dave Whitmore has a very small portion of your week a very small portion of your week. You live outside of this building. You live outside of this building. And Dave Whitmore lives outside of this building, and that's why he's worshiping, not just today, but he's been worshiping all week and next week as he's away in a mission field. He's worshiping through his work, and his, his passion is driving him. It's not a passion for self-recognition, and it's not a, a passion for uh, self-glorification. Uh, it's a passion for Jesus Christ and the work that follows. And that's where our worship comes in. Are we worshiping and honoring in adoration directed toward God? When we worship, is it honor and adoration directed toward God? So I want to challenge you this morning. If your worship primarily orbits around what's being said and done right here on Sunday morning, which is good, I want to challenge you to broaden your horizon, broaden your vision for worship, and challenge you to seek opportunities to give adoration and love to God, to the King of Kings, outside of just this hour and a half during your family. Are you able to look at your family and go, God, thank you. Thank you for blessing me with this child. If something's been taken away from you, are you able to look at that and go, God, thank you. Praise you for giving me as much time with this job as I had. Thank you. Praise you. Now, God, help me find something else, Lord. I depend on you. Are we fully worshiping outside of just this room? And if you're sitting here this morning and you're not sure you're a Christian or you know you're not a Christian, then this is the call of Jesus to you to see that the gospel doesn't end at the sending of the Son into this world. The gospel doesn't end in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We praise and glorify God because of that moment where God became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. But the gospel doesn't end there. The gospel continues on. The gospel continues to say that he dies on a cross to save people from sin. He doesn't stay dead. He rises three days later. That's the gospel. That's the truth. That's the hope. That's the life that we have in the gospel. That we're not cursed to eternal damnation because of our sin. And so what's our response? To believe. To believe that this boy born of a virgin laid in the feeding trough, whether it was in a cave or a, or a barn, that the word of the Father is the Son of God, is the Savior of sinners, is our Savior. And don't you love in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, what Paul says? He articulates this beautifully. He says that he loved me and gave himself for me. Insert your name where it says me. For me, it is he loved Ben and gave himself for Ben. And I want you to focus on that word, me. He loves me, Ben. He loves you. Insert your name. Do you see how intimate his love for each and every one of his children is? He loves us. It wasn't just that he gave us, which he did and we're thankful for, but he loved us on top of the giving. He gave his son for you and he loves you. 
And so there's two responses that I'm calling you to this morning. One is to believe and receive Jesus Christ as a Savior. And the second is, if you've already done that, that to rejoice and fall down with gratitude and worship, not just within the hour and a half that we're here, but throughout your week so that you are a living worshiper. Not that we just chisel it out for an hour and a half of the week, but that we live it. So you're faced with an opportunity right now to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And at the end of this service, if you have questions about what that means or what that looks like, there's people in this room. I'm willing to help. I'm willing to answer questions. Stop. Ask us. There's leadership in this room that are willing to answer and pray with you. And believers, brothers, sisters in Christ, I pray that this would not be the beginning of our worship, but the end of our week's worship.